When I was in the New Hampshire State Legislature, I served on the State Federal Relations and Veterans Affairs Committee. It was apparently important that as a representative of the sovereign people who had elected me to this honorable office, that I be updated on a large number of topics related to the affairs of our people and our nation. I would like to submit to our nation my personal testimony of one document related to one of these ongoing topics which I saw while in office serving on the State Federal Relations and Veterans Affairs Committee. The document I saw was an official brief to President Eisenhower. To the best of my memory, this brief was pervaded with a sense of hope and it informed President Eisenhower of the continued presence of extraterrestrial beings here in the United States of America. The brief seemed to indicate that a meeting between the President and some of these visitors could be arranged as appropriate if desired. The tone of the brief indicated to me that there was no need for concern since these visitors were in no way causing any harm or had any intention whatsoever of causing any disruption then or in the future. While I can't verify the times or places or that any meeting or meetings occurred directly between Eisenhower and these visitors, because of his optimism in his farewell address in 1961, I personally believe that Eisenhower did indeed meet with these extraterrestrial off-world astronauts. I hope my personal testimony will aid the nation in its quest for continued enlightenment. When Eisenhower was supposed to land, we were, or come in, the day before he was to come in, a parade for, to honor him was canceled. The President of the United States is entitled to full military honors at any base that he lands on. And that means a parade. Dr. Reiner asked me if I wanted to go to the parade, and I said no. He said, okay, you're working. Darcy Moore was the airman in charge of our little group. He wasn't an officer, he was an airman. When Darcy came in about 15 minutes later, he said, Kirkland, did you see what's out at the on the flight line? I said, what is it? He says, it's a disc, hovering disc. I'm thinking disc that you can throw, 12 inches maybe, wooden with a steel rim, the only thing that I knew that hovered, other than that, was a helicopter and the Navy's hovercraft. And I'm saying, oh, I said, what's it made of? He says, metal, like polished aluminum, polished steel. He said, you know, metal. I said, how big is it? He said, 20 to 30 feet. I said, no, I haven't seen it. He said, do you want to see it? I said, yes. I said, I'd like to see it. He said, go out to the front of the hospital, he says, and look down at the flight line. He said, you'll see it. I said, with my luck, I said, I would go out there and it wouldn't be there. He said, I wouldn't say that. He says, I took my wife to the commissary and was there 30 minutes later when I left. And I said, well, I'll ask. In a base where there's war conditions, regardless of where you're at, you're on 24-7. And I, if you leave your assigned spot, that's against the law, military law. So I asked the nurse who had asked the doctor if I could go out to the front and see it. She looked at the doctor and the doctor said no, so I didn't go. Nine o'clock, go for coffee. Coming back from coffee, I'm following two 
young pilots. The one on the left is in khakis, the one on the right is in blues. The one on the left said, why the blues? He says, I'm the officer of the day. He says, I've been down at base ops all day. He says, waiting for the plane to come in. He said, Air Force One? He said, yes. Air Force One, that was the first time I heard Air Force One. I didn't know what it meant. I had to ask that too. Well, in the 60s, that was very common. But in the 40s, it was the first time I heard it. He says, well, what happened? He said, he landed, he turned around on the active and shut down. And we were told to turn off our radar. Why were you told to turn off your radar? I don't know. He said, we were told to turn it off, so we turned them off. And then the guy in the khaki said, I heard that the one that was brought down at Roswell was brought down with Doppler radar. And he said, I don't know. They were continued talking. What happened after that? He said, they came out over the mountains across the proving ground, White Sands proving ground, across the monument, and the guy on the left again, the khaki guy said, I heard one landed at the monument. He said, the other one said, I don't know about that. I'm telling you what I saw. He says, two of them came over. One landed on the reactive in front of the plane. And the other one hovered overhead like it was like it was protecting that plane. He got out of his plane, walked to the UFO, and the door opened, and he walked inside. How long was he in there? About 40 or 45 minutes. Could you see? Were they grays? He says, I couldn't see. I didn't have binoculars. Who had the binoculars? The tower. Could they see? No, they didn't have the angle. This is all going on while I'm walking behind them. Probably no more from here to the lobby area. And as they were doing this, one of them said, did you see, the one on the left again, did you see the autopsy film? And the one on the right said, yes. Do you think it's real? I don't know. So it was available in 55. Uh, and he said, well, he said, does electronic waves, radio waves go through plastic? He said, why do you ask that? He said, because I think there's a radar unit in the nose of that airplane. And I'm saying, who are you talking about? I said, are you pilots? And they shut up, turned around so I couldn't read their names, and walked on. After work, I'm in my barracks room, and I'm called outside to the back of the barracks because Air Force One is flying over the residential area at Holloman Air Force Base. That's a no-fly area zone. I ran out, looked for it. I had to jump up because the plane was flying low and it just passed over the roof of our building. Air Force One flew from Holloman at about, you know, 4 o'clock, maybe 4.30. And from supper, I went out and I looked at the flight surgeon's office and the lights were on. I said, I wonder what's going on because part of my job is to check and make sure the lights go out. So I walked over and there was Captain Reiner talking to a lieutenant colonel who was in blues. And he said, Colonel was talking, he said, Bob, he said, I was there on stage with him, standing room only, 225 people in the supply hangar. And Bob said, Captain Reiner said, that he had heard that he had talked at the base theater. He said he might have been, because he only spoke for a couple of minutes, and then he left, and the base commander spoke for about 20 he could have had plenty of time to go over the base theater and come back. He said, but I'm telling you is what I saw. Standing room only in the supply hangar, 225 people each time it was there. And I said, what did he talk about? He says, it's classified. I said, how is it classified? Confidential? He says, higher. I said, secret. He said, higher. I said, oh. He says, what's the O? I said, I'm only classified to secret. It's none of my business. 
And he says, I would not say that if I were you. Okay? About three months after that, I was getting ready to go overseas, and I asked a bunch of guys that were there, and because I said, I have never heard a president talk. Have any of you ever heard a president talk? They said, yes. One of them said, yes. I said, who? He said, Eisenhower. I said, where? He said, the base theater. And another airman said, hey. And the conversation stopped, just like that. Some letters right here. I'm sure I'll find that one. Yeah, here's the one that uh, Dad, Mom and Dad wrote. Okay, that's uh, Auburn, Nebraska, October 26, 1989. Dear kids, it's beautiful he fall here with the usual pumpkins up and down the main drag. Kids are getting excited. Your, your father and I are doing well. Heard from Helen. She said the grandchild came on time. And although Sharon was in labor, well, I, you don't need to talk about that. Anyway, Dad has just come from the kitchen with a cup of coffee. And he says he doesn't mind telling the fireman's story again. But you kids know it better after all these years. But he'll recall what he can. All right, this is the part. Yeah, well, you kids and mom moved down from Albuquerque. I think it was in the summer of 1954. As you recall, I had taken the Hollerman job that previous winter, and mom wanted us all together, so we rented a place over near Dudley Elementary School on Maryland, wasn't it? Remember, you kids could walk to school. You were, you were in the fourth grade, and Billy was in first or second. Anyhow, Sometime after Christmas of 55, we were told President Eisenhower was coming. So George, our boss then at the electric shop, went to a meeting to find out more. He would not be inspecting anything, and they said, just carry on as usual. If you see the president, don't gawk, wave, or anything, just carry on. So the day the president came, we went out in the truck to a job where we were replacing some wire down the flight line. It was really old stuff, but that it put there in World War II, and safe. So we heard the president's plane in the morning lining up for an approach and watched it land on the far runway. So we waited for it to taxi over to the flight line so we could see him. But we didn't hear it anymore, and it had shut down somewhere out there. So we went ahead and pulled wire for a while, and one of the men, I, I believe it was Charlie, said he can see out there from that pole over there. So why don't one of us go up the pole and see where the plane is? Well, I had my clim climbers on and I started to unbuckle them and was waiting to give them to the first volunteer. When someone said I should do it as people were used to seeing me up on the poles anyway. So I started up with my back to the sun, a safety measure, which also put my back to the runway where we thought as Connie was. Connie was a nickname for the big constellation the president flew. As I started up, some of the guys reminded me not to gawk, and I heard them laugh. A few minutes later, I heard some shouting, and some guys tarring a hangar roof nearby started to run, pointing out to the runways. Then I heard our truck start up, and some of the crew jumped in with one or two running after it. And they were pointing out to the flight line, and so I decided to turn around on the pole to see what the ruckus was about. And I could not believe what I saw. There was this pie tin-like thing coming at me about 150 feet away. I thought it was remote controlled or, or something. 25 to 30 feet across, and I started down the pole as fast as I could go. I was up about 40 feet, and I threw my climbing rope out, gave it slack, and only touched a spike on each side of the pole three or four times on each side in before I got to the bottom. While I was running towards the big hangar, I looked back and it had stopped and was just sitting there. Well, when we all got back to the shop and we had a good lap, one of the guys who saw me come down said he got down that pole faster than a fireman. So as you kids were growing up and we had the family gatherings, you used to ask to tell me about the time I became a fireman. You know, I always wondered why we did not use that thing during Vietnam and so forth. And over the years I realized if we had technology like that, it would have saved lots of lives. But I gradually realized that it had something to do with Ike being there that day. And it wasn't ours. It was an unwritten rule at Holloman. You didn't talk about what you saw. And after that day, 
It was seldom mentioned at the shop. I still have those climbers here someplace. Billy used to play with them. Remember? Mom here again. Well, my job was loading and uh, delivering uh, a cargo. Anything they wanted, we would fly it. As we were there, we saw Air Force One come in, and uh, we didn't know who it was. And then we come, uh, an officer come around and says, "You can't leave." And I says, "Well, we." The pilot said, "We have to leave." And he says, "Well, President Eisenhower is here, and." You can't leave the field until he's gone. And one of the other officers, a higher ranking officer, came to us and says, would you like to go in and eat and listen to his speech? And most of us said, yeah. But they did leave us go in at the very end and we ate and listened to his speech. What do you think of him? I thought he was great. He had a lot of good ideas. Dave, you remember what uh, what date that was that you were there? Uh, the reason I know it, uh, when he was there is here's what I got discharged. He was there in mid February of 1955. That was my last trip that I made while I was in the service.